Let's get real. Hello everyone, and welcome back to JW Reality TV, Tell All. I'm Frank Lee Anon, and joining me in the studio are Stephen and Gloria Morris. And, assisting them off stage, their children, Galib and Sappho. In our previous episodes of the, Tell All, we have examined the Watchtower's House of Cards, the doctrinal structure that supports their most controversial policies. We have found that the key doctrine is their claim that the governing body is the faithful and discreet slave. We have been examining these doctrinal cards one at a time, and crossing them out as we go. Next is the generation card. Tell us about that, Stephen. Jesus said that the generation that witnessed the signs of the end would by no means pass away before all these things occurred. And he was referring to the events of 70 CE, correct? Well, yes, in its typical fulfillment. But more importantly, he meant that the generation that recognized the signs in 1914 of the start of the last days, would live to see the end of the last days, Armageddon, and the ushering in of the new world. That's how we know that the time is short, that generation is getting up in years now. This is another example of a Watchtower prophecy that failed. The 1914 generation is dead. And that fact has forced the governing body into an absurd attempt to save face. They jerry-rigged an extension to their timeline. Now they say that the word generation means two generations, the people who witnessed 1914, plus any Jehovah's Witness anointed while anyone from that first generation was still alive, an overlapping generation. In the Frankenstein-like lab of mental gymnastics, they grafted one generation onto another and called their resultant monstrosity one generation. What's wrong with that? We commonly use generation to refer to people alive at the same time. It's mathematically impossible. You're saying G equals 2G, where G stands for generation. If G is something, rather than nothing, a zero then that's an invalid equation. Something cannot equal two of itself. It's also an infinite regress. If you say, the generation refers to the 1914 generation and the overlapping generation, then the first, generation, in that sentence means two generations, and the two generations in this sentence means four generations, which means eight generations, and so on, until you have an infinite number of generations. No. It only refers to those two generations. The next generation of Christians, anointed after the 1914 generation had all died, don't count as the generation. Why not? They'd have to count, Dad, according to the most basic of logic. If the overlapping generation, B in our chart, is the same generation as the 1914 generation, A in our chart, because of the fact that they overlap, then the next generation that overlaps with Generation B would, by the same logic, have to be the same generation as it, which you're saying is the 1914 generation. So, Generation C would also be the 1914 generation, as would any future generation, D through Z. Because if A equals B, and B equals C, then A equals C, and C equals A. It's inescapable. So, your overlapping generation fallacy, doesn't make the end of the world imminent, it allows for an infinite number of generations. I'd also point out that this first overlapping generation has an even greater span of years than the original 1914 generation. When considering the overlapping generation, the Watchtower focuses its attention on individuals who were anointed just prior to the 1914 gangs dying out. But the overlapping generation would have begun in the year 1915, with anointed ones who just missed the events of 1914. This second group, then, would currently span at least 107 years. Judging by their perceived need to extend the generation, the governing body assumed that the 1914 generation had died off by 2010, a span of 96 years. So, at 107 years, this second group, brought in to bolster their failing doctrine regarding the first group, has already exceeded the time limit the governing body had themselves set for the first group. 
It thereby fails the governing body's own requirement that a generation be not excessively long. So when the term, generation, is used with reference to people living at a particular time, the exact length of that time cannot be stated except that it does have an end and would not be excessively long. Watchtower February 15, 2008, page 25. To put it simply, the overlapping generation could only extend the 1914 generation by one year since it had to start in 1915. So, at best, the doctrine would have failed just one year after the death of the 1914 generation. From this, we see that the current generation teaching has its own self-destructing flaw built in from the get-go. The overlapping generation would have already expired by 2011. Removing the last vestige of hope for their generation doctrine as well as any remaining tie to the year 1914. Doesn't the fact that the 1914 generation died, disprove everything about 1914? How can this religion keep going, after such an obvious and flagrant false prophecy, that they proclaimed for decades? Well, it can't just be a coincidence that there were seven times between the destruction of Jerusalem in 607 BCE and the year 1914. So, it comes down to the remaining card of 607 BCE, supporting all of the weight of 1914. But the destruction of Jerusalem by Nebuchadnezzar wasn't in the year 607 BCE, that's just a year the Watchtower, or their predecessors, the Adventists, made up to align with their 1914 date. The historic date is actually 587 BCE, in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's rule, as the Bible says. Here are the real, historical dates of the dynasty they're referring to. The Watchtower agrees with the final date, 539 BCE as the year when Babylon was overthrown by Cyrus of Persia and the Jewish captivity came to an end. So, we work backwards in time from that date to their captivity. The Watchtower also agrees with the lengths of the Babylonian king's reigns, shown at the top. Here is a list of those kings. The highlighted numbers are where the Watchtower agrees with the historical record. Adding up these reigns gives us a total of 66 years, which we display with an arrow on our timeline, from the start of Nebuchadnezzar's reign to the end of the dynasty in 539 BCE. But notice the gap in the Watchtower's sequence between the reigns of Nabonidus and Labashi Marduk, the last two kings of the dynasty. 18 years are unaccounted for. This gap is unhistorical and unaccounted for by the Watchtower. It is inconceivable that there were 18 years in which there was no king of Babylon and that every archaeologist and historian and every expert in this field missed it and only the uneducated men of the governing body somehow discovered it. The Watchtower claims that it took two years for the Jews to return to Judah after their release, so they moved that date from 539 to 537. They also claim that the Jews were held captive in Babylon for 70 years, moving the date of their exile back to 607 BCE. Since the Bible clearly states that this occurred in the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign, they have to move his reign back as well, from the historic date of 605 BCE to their bogus date of 624. Since they agree with the lengths of all the king's reigns, the subsequent king's reigns are moved accordingly, except for Nabonidus whom they agree was king at the end of the dynasty and who reigned 13 years. This opens up that 18-year watchtower caused gap we mentioned. The funny thing is, the very same experts, using the very same dating methods, have given us the 539 date and the 587 date, and the watchtower accepts the one and denies the other. Why does the watchtower insist on 607 BCE as the year of the exile, in denial of all the facts? It's for the sake of 1914. Remember the seven times of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? From totally unrelated Bible verses, the Watchtower claims that a time equals 360 days, and so 7 times 360 equals 2,520 days. Then they take their day for a year formula to arrive at 2,520 years, which is the length of time between 607 BCE and 1914 CE. But, if they were honest, they'd add 2,520 to 587 BCE and arrive at 1934 instead of 1914. True, but they're also dishonestly converting from 360 day years to 365 and a quarter day years. If they held to their own definition of 360 day years, they'd arrive at 1877 using their bogus starting year of 607 or 1897 using the correct starting year of 587. 
well, we can choose to believe the worldly so-called experts, who are probably being misled by Satan in order to hide God's timeline, or we can go by the Bible. The Bible tells us that the Jews were captive in Babylon for 70 years, which gives us the 607 BCE date. Galib? For this is what Jehovah says, when 70 years at Babylon are fulfilled, I will turn my attention to you, and I will make good my promise by bringing you back to this place. Jeremiah 29.10 Case closed. But other Christians believe both the Bible and the experts and find no conflict in the date 587 for the exile. How do they do that, Gloria? Once again, the New World Translation is the only translation that corresponds to the Watchtower's interpretation. It says that the Jews would be at Babylon for 70 years. How do other translations render the verse, Sappho? The New International Version has, when 70 years are completed, for, Babylon. The New English Translation has, when the 70 years of Babylonian rule are over. This shows that the 70 years applied to the total time period when Babylon was a world power. How long was Babylon a world power? For, 70 years. During that time, the Jews, and others, were subject to them, but not for the entire 70 years, only from when they were conquered by Babylon and only until Babylon itself was conquered in 539 BCE. This is exactly the interpretation the Watchtower itself gives for Tyre, who had a similar experience as Jerusalem, some 13 years later, as prophesied in the book of Isaiah. Not long after the fall of Jerusalem, Tyre rebels against Babylon, and Nebuchadnezzar lays siege to the city. He says, these nations will have to serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Tyre is not subject to Babylon for a full 70 years, since the Babylonian Empire falls in 539 BCE. Evidently, the 70 years represents the period of Babylonia's greatest domination. Different nations come under that domination at different times. But at the end of 70 years, that domination will crumble. Isaiah's Prophecy, Light for All Mankind, Volume 1 Pages 252-253 That's how you harmonize the historical facts with the Bible, in this instance. But there is no reconciling of the facts with the Watchtower. The 587 BCE date is one of the best documented dates in history, with over 2,000 cuneiform tablets confirming the date. The Watchtower just rewrites history to fit its own timelines. We saw that, in Rutherford's changing the date of his imprisonment to match their doctrine about 1919. Yes, and possibly the most egregious example is when they changed the measurements of the pyramid when it failed to match their dates. Russell believed that God had built the Great Pyramid of Giza in such a way that the number of inches in its passageways corresponded to the years in his timeline. Russell traveled to Egypt in order to measure the pyramid for himself, which he called the Bible in stone. It seemed these were dates literally cast in stone and could never change. Yet, compare the 1891 edition of Russell's book, Thy Kingdom Come, Volume 2 of his Studies in the Scriptures, with the 1911 edition, where one of these critical measurements magically stretched some 41 inches to correspond with the Watchtower's doctrinal change from the year 1874 to the year 1914. It may be cast in stone, but, just like the truth, I can still stretch it. This was also done with the 607 date itself. Originally, the Watchtower claimed this date was 606 BCE. But, when they realized that this would yield 1915 rather than 1914, because they'd failed to take into account that there was no zero year between BCE and CE, they simply rewrote their already rewritten history and changed the date of Jerusalem's capture from 606 to 607 BCE. So, instead of changing their doctrine to match the facts, they changed the facts to match their doctrine. Is that honest, Dad? Well, that passage in the pyramid was blocked when Russell first made his measurements. Later, when access was gained, he changed his timeline to match the new measurements. Wait. He published these measurements for years as his, Divine Plan of the Ages, without ever having actually made the measurements? That's not very discreet. I've already said that we've abandoned the idea of Russell ever having been the faithful and discreet slave, and we've long since discarded the idea of the pyramid being of any significance, so it's a moot point. 
Not really. The watchtower's last word on the subject was when Rutherford said, It is more reasonable to conclude that the Great Pyramid of Giza, as well as the other pyramids thereabout, also the Sphinx, were built by the rulers of Egypt and under the directions of Satan the Devil. Then Satan put his knowledge in dead stone, which may be called, Satan's Bible, and not, God's stone witness. Watchtower 1928, November 15, page 344. I'd say that was pretty significant, that Satan went to all that trouble to mislead Russell and initially Rutherford, causing them to waste their time preaching falsehoods. I don't know of any other structures in the world that can lay claim to having Satan as their architect, so I'd say that's pretty significant. Do you suppose it will be one of the first targets in Armageddon of God's fiery boulders from heaven? Wait. The change from 1874 to 1914 was based on Satan's Bible? The Watchtower claims that Jehovah corrects their understanding, but I guess in this instance it was Satan correcting them. But doesn't that make the 1914 doctrine a satanic teaching? Very funny, you two. We're getting a little sidetracked here. The main takeaway as I see it, is that the year 607 BCE as the year of the Jewish exile has no support other than from the governing body, and even then is self-contradictory, as it introduces an 18-year gap in the timeline. Since this card is being used to support the contention that the governing body is the faithful slave, we can't solely use their authority as the basis for its truth, that would be circular reasoning, which can never lead to truth. The 607 BCE card must therefore be crossed out. Now, since 1914 depends for its support on all the cards beneath it, and all those cards have been crossed out, the 1914 card must be crossed out as well. And, since 1919 depends on 1914, out it goes. Finally, since the governing body's claim to be, the slave, depends on the 1919 date. Drum roll, please. It gets crossed out as well, leaving no card uncrossed. Can I blow now? By all means, and make a wish while you're at it. Evacuate! Kids, Structure has become unstable! Exit. Evacuate! Structure has become unstable! Come on, Steven, get out of there! Run! Help me! I'm trapped! The world is an evil place, I don't want to go there! Do you know what I wished for, when I blew down the house of cards? That all of our hard work, researching all of this, would be enough to wake you up! and have you join us back in the real world. We love you dad, we want you back. Be a man, Stephen. I resent that. He means, be a strong person, dad. We can only show you the way. The rest is up to you, you have to stand up on your own two feet and accept the reality of the world as it is. Sure, there is plenty of bad, but there's good as well. We can only reduce the bad and increase the good by our own efforts. But I want to live forever on a paradise earth, in peace and love, with no hunger or crime. And I want to pet a lion. Then get up and do something about it. You have to participate in the progress of the world, not just wait on Jehovah to fix everything. Plant a tree, recycle, sponsor a third world child, volunteer at a homeless shelter, mentor underprivileged kids, go vegan, and adopt a cat from a pet shelter. And eliminate the hatred in your own heart. You know that you harbor hatred towards gays and apostates. Peace begins with you. But I'll lose all my friends at the Kingdom Hall, they'll shun me if I come back to reality. You'll make new friends, whose friendship won't be conditional on your belief. Besides, many of them are already out here, in the XJW community, ready to welcome you with understanding and open arms. Leaving now would be just like running out of Noah's Ark just before the rain started to fall. And, once it starts falling, it'll be too late to get back in. No, not anymore. 
that's what they used to believe. But at the 2023 annual meeting, it was announced that you will have the opportunity to come back, after the start of the Great Tribulation. Sometimes it's a bit hard to remember, was that what we used to believe, or is this what we believe now? Once the Great Tribulation starts, with the destruction of Babylon the Great, is there a door of opportunity for non-believers to actually join us? What have we said in the past? We've said, no. Basically, we viewed the account of the flood as being a type and anti-type uh, portrayal, and that we forethought the fact that the door of the ark was closed prior to the flood coming indicated that the door of opportunity would close once the Great Tribulation started. But notice Jesus didn't say anything that indicated this was a type anti type arrangement, and he certainly didn't mention anything with regard to a door of opportunity closing. So let's think about some that we know, perhaps unbelieving relatives, disfellowshipped ones, others that have heard the message, perhaps studied with us. Could some of them, once they see the destruction of Babylon the Great, decide that what Jehovah's Witnesses were saying is correct after all? Could they take a stand for the truth? So, you can be free now, and if you ever see the Watchtower's version of the Great Tribulation, with the United Nations starting to attack and destroy religions, you can run back to the Kingdom Hall, and be accepted back in, and still survive Armageddon, and pet your lion. Stephen, it sounds like you've run out of reasons to stay enslaved to the Watchtower. Which means you're now free to divorce me, and remarry. And, help mom pay for my dance lessons. Come on, dad, get up and do the, freedom dance. We are dancing with our children, upon a grassy knoll, or laughing loudly, hand in hand, happily out of control. We're Christians, pagans, atheists, together in the sun. We share a common history, a freedom we have won. We broke the chains that shackled us within the blood-soaked halls, burst out of mind-locked prisons, and climbed those tower walls. Now we share a common journey, saints and sinners all the same. We don't agree on everything, but that is not our aim. We are here to love each other, to share a laugh or sigh. Arms for hugging, hearts in tune, shoulders on which to cry. We did not leave the truth, we did not flee from love. We simply learned such precious things aren't ruled by those above. As for their threats of Armageddon, we'll do more than just survive, we'll not waste our lives in cringing fear, we shall live our lives alive. They swing their swords and hurl their hailstones and hate us as they must. Our love melts hail to gentle rain and turns their swords to dust. And when we're weak or lonely, confused or in despair, we have a place to come to, there's someone here who'll care. For you who languish still in prison, in your endless passion play, we have illumination, we're here to light the way. We offer understanding to patch up all the holes, burned so deeply in your minds and in your weary souls. So join us in our zest for life as we laugh here in the sun. The joy is in the journey, and we've only just begun.